Hello everybody, we are back for another lecture on blood vessels. Hopefully this will be the second to last one. Don't want to have too many of them. So, let's get going. We gotta talk about the pulse. We can see this uh, naked dude here. He's got pulse points all over him. At any of these points, you could use your fingers, you could feel the pressure wave in his arteries that is created when blood vessels contract. And you can hear my little toddler there talking to me as well. Um, so, where were we? Blood vessels, pulse. At any of these spots, we could feel the pressure wave that occurs when the heart contracts. It doesn't matter where you measure it in terms of the rate. The rate should be the same. It should be identical to heart rate. Obviously, it's important to measure it at different places to make sure tissues are being perfused. All right. So with that, we go from pulse rate to pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is the change in arterial pressure that is created every time the heart contracts. So we know pretty much blood pressure goes up when the heart squeezes, and then blood pressure comes back down as the heart relaxes. Remember we talked about systolic versus diastolic blood pressures. And the difference between the systolic and the diastolic is, of course, the pulse pressure. So mathematically, it's systolic minus diastolic. It is going to be greatly impacted by stroke volume. It's going to vary directly with stroke volume. Of course, here the systolic is 120, diastolic is 80, so the pulse pressure would, of course, be 40. Okay, now onward to mean arterial pressure. So we know blood pressure in our arteries fluctuates. We know it goes up and it comes back down. Um, this basically happens because the arteries are elastic. They can store pressure during the heart's contractile phase and then release that pressure as the heart relaxes. So we have this change in pressure. The map is the average pressure driving blood flow. We know, of course, blood pressure drives blood flow. Now, map is not a straight average. It is a weighted average. Notice how the mean pressure here line is closer to diastolic than the systolic. We weigh diastolic more heavily. The reason we do this is because we spend more time closer to the diastolic pressure value. All right, two equations here for you. First one is my most favorite. The map is two-thirds your diastolic plus a third of the systolic. Now, this tells me nicely that the uh, diastolic is weighed twice as heavy as the systolic. You could do a little algebraic manipulation. I know all of you guys love algebraic manipulation. And you could take the diastolic and simply add one third of the pulse pressure. You'd get the same thing. We can go over at why these two things are equivalent. If you'd like, just grab me in the hall and I'll be happy to do that. All right, this is great. This is a set of problems. We either did this already or are about to do this in uh, the classroom. So, onward from arterial pressures to capillary pressures. Capillary pressure is pretty low. Goes from about 40 at the beginning of the cap to about 20 at the end. Obviously, it declines because, well, two reasons. Number one, distance from the heart goes up. Number two, you're going to lose a little fluid. Remember, we do a little more pushing out of fluid than we do pulling back in. Now, why is this low blood pressure good? Well, look at this wall here. This is simple squamous epithelium. It is thin, super duper thin, which is fantastic for exchange, but not so good for strength. So low pressure is good for that. All righty. What about venous blood pressure? It's even lower because we're even farther from the heart. This is good. I mean, it lets veins be superficial. You can see this dude's vein. I'm assuming this is a guy here. Um, you can see his median cubital vein there. If you cut it, it's not going to squirt blood because the pressure is low in it. Now, there is a downside to this low pressure. The downside is that there will be a very small gradient pushing blood from these veins back towards the superior vena cava. There's not much of a gradient driving blood flow back to the heart. Now, this blood flow back to the heart is known as venous return. And there are five things that we must discuss 
that are responsible for it. Starting with that blood pressure in your veins. Your veins have got some blood, they got some blood pressure, and that remaining pressure there is due to the contraction of the heart. Other things that can impact venous return include gravity, the skeletal muscle pump, the respiratory pump, and a little something called venomotor action. All right, check out this graph in the encircled area. In your veins, pressure is low, but there is still something. So that something, that remnant of the heart's systolic force is going to drive blood flow. Meanwhile, gravity. This lady is letting gravity work for her. Her head, her arms are at level with her heart. Her thighs, her legs are up. She's going to have good venous return. This dude, um, you know, if he stands there long enough, not so much. Blood's going to tend to pull. Gravity's mostly going to work against him. Okay, what else, what else, what else? Skeletal muscle pump. This lady is running. She is running fast. All right. And you can realize, of course, when you're, when you're running, muscles are contracting. And contracting muscles squeeze the veins that run next to them and in between them. As the veins are squeezed, blood is forced upward back to the heart. Blood is going to try to go down, but luckily the venous valves will prevent that backflow from occurring. This is called the skeletal muscle pump. This is why it's important to cool down, to jog slowly or walk at the end of high-intensity exercise. Another thing called the respiratory pump. All right, this guy right here, this lady rather, is about to breathe in. Okay, ready? So she, uh, this lady over here is about to breathe in. Oh, she just took a big deep breath. Her diaphragm flattened out. Look how curvy it was before. It flattens out. And the flat diaphragm, what that does is it enlarges the thorax. When you enlarge the thorax, the pressure in the thorax declines. It declines. And as it declines, well, that is going to draw blood into these veins, the superior vena cava, the brachiocephalics, because their pressure is going to decline as well. This is known as the respiratory pump. Okie dokie. One more slide and we'll end this little lecture. Suppose you are in a fight or flight situation. You are exercising. Your sympathetic nervous system is turned on, turned on like crazy. And what that'll do is it'll cause the release of norepinephrine, good old NE, onto the tunica media, the smooth muscle there. It's going to increase. And of course, we know that norepinephrine is going to make that tunica media smooth muscle contract. And as such, venous pressure is going to rise. And as such, there's going to be a greater pressure gradient forcing blood back to the heart. So venous return will go up as well. And with that, we are done this little lecture, and I will see you later.